Welcome to the Best Of series, where we're celebrating the most inspiring moments and powerful insights from our recent episodes. Whether you're new to the podcast or a longtime listener, these highlights capture the heart of our conversations, bringing you wisdom, guidance, and a fresh perspective on the journey of growth, love, and healing. Join us as we revisit these transformative discussions and discover the gems that have resonated the most with our listeners and with me. Let's dive in and explore what makes these moments truly unforgettable. Let's take the scenario of someone has this budding sense of like, ooh, I I have this dream, I have this desire, I, I want something, but everything is too challenging. Life is hard. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. Yes. What are they, what, where do they even begin when they feel just that is meant for you? Even if it's not the full thing, like sometimes our soul, our spirit is wise enough to guide us towards something. And then we'll take a little detour and that's the real place we're supposed to go. So we have to trust those little breadcrumbs. So that's number one is trust that that dream is there for a reason. Your soul is trying to get you on a particular path. Now, when it comes to the constraints, not enough time, not enough money, you don't have a skill. Here's what I like to do with myself. And I would invite people to try this on as much as humanly possible. I try to live an excuse free life because here's what I found for myself. And I'll take this back to college days. I remember when I was in college and I was like one of those, you know, I wanted to be my straight A student. I'm competitive. I want to be at the top of the class. I'm going to be the best of the best. And my friends would often ask me because of bookworm, they're like, Marie, why don't you come out tonight? And I was like, no, I got to study. You know, and I was like, I'm too busy. I'm like working at the church and I'm doing this. And I'm doing that. I was like, no, no, no. Ain't got the time. Ain't got the time. Ain't got the time. And I remember one day a certain gentleman with dark hair and nice biceps came and asked me, like, hey, Marie, you know, do you want to go to this concert? I was like, yes, please. All of a sudden, that no time that I had that I believed to be the truth because of all of my classes and the exam in the morning, somehow I magically created the time to go out on this date with this handsome young snack that it was like, "Mm," right? So it made me realize when I went, I was like, wow, look at that. You thought you were telling the truth when you kept saying, you don't have the time, you don't have the time, you don't have time. But then when something got important enough, Miss Marie, you knew how to make the time. And I have watched myself do that in many different instances. I've had friends and I've had people write to me and say, yeah, I don't have money. I don't have money. I don't have money. And all of a sudden you either get that invitation from that special someone, or there's a particular thing and you find that money for that bus ticket or that train ticket or that plane ticket. You're just like, whoa, right? Because you were, it was important enough for you. You figured out a way, you borrowed, you attracted, you met, you, some kind of magic happened and you made it happen. And so for me, I am very, very interested in continuing to call myself out. Anytime in my inner monologue, I'm saying, oh, I can't because I don't have the time or I can't because I don't have the money. Right? And I'm like, that is some bullshit. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you another example from more recently in my life. I remember I had on my goal list, right? Little dream. I was like, I really want to learn to speak Italian. Like I'm, you know, I'm writing this goal down every year, every year, every year. And I'm like, God, and I, you know, I'm doing my Duolingo. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But it's like, it's just not happening. And then I remember I had to get real honest with myself because it wasn't like part of me was saying, oh, well, you don't have the time. You know, you're running this business. You got a show, you're doing this, you're doing that. You're like, you're okay, girl. You just don't have the time. But here's the truth, Scott. When I was done with my work for the day and when I was done creating the show or doing the meals or, you know, being with whoever, you know what my ass was doing? I was watching some Game of Thrones. (laughs) I'm laying on the damn couch. I got time for that. So it told me very clearly. Do do you know what I mean? That Uh, in this uh, through for anyone who's like, girl, I'm kind of with you, but I'm kind of mad at you. I don't think you know my circumstances. You absolutely have no friggin' idea what I'm dealing with. I would ask you to, to not judge me super fast. Just go take the book out from the library and go look at the no excuses book, the no excuses chapter, because we run through literally very actionable, practical ways for all of us, myself included, whenever there is a constraint around time or money or capabilities and so many stories of how folks that I guarantee you'll be like, ah, shit. Well, if they did it, like, you know, yeah. oh, okay. It's confronting but, as fuck. I will it say. It is confronting <laughs> as fuck. It is. It is. But this in is the but, best way. In, in the, the most important way. way. In the most yeah. important way. Because 
all of us, it's like we have this, these magical blocks of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which equals 168 hours and everyone's in different circumstance. But here's what I've known to be true. Even if you can carve out 15 to 20 minutes a day to devote towards any micro change or major change that you want to make in your life, whether it's around your health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health, doesn't matter. Whether it's about your career, whether it's about your finances, I promise you that you already have what it takes to start to get a toehold in and start to make a little bit of progress. And once we all start making a little bit of progress, we start feeling real good. And when we start feeling real good, what happens is we get more creative ideas on how to expand that momentum and we get more confidence. And then we start building momentum. It's like a, a happy, beautiful progress snowball that starts to build. So we're not looking for, and you don't have to just change your whole life right now. And all of those constraints, those are real and they're a pain in the ass. But here's what I also promise you. There is a way for you to get a toehold in and, and we can help you with that. Mm. Okay. Okay. You got me. <laughs> right. But here's the truth. Like getting, for me, like getting honest with me, yeah. you know, like whatever it is, it's like, girl, stop saying you don't got the energy, the time. Say it's not my priority right now. Yes. Like that's much more honest. And yeah. then all of a sudden I get energy back. Why? Because I'm not beating myself up yeah. thinking that I'm not doing enough, you know, yeah. or I'm not this enough or I'm not like, that's some bullshit. It's like, yeah. no this stage and season of my life, here's what I'm, here's what I'm prioritizing Mm -hmm. and all these other beautiful little potential goals, they can wait a minute. And Mm -hmm. if I really want them to not wait a minute, then I need to make some grown up adult choices, um, and need to be responsible for that. We really are our own worst energy thief. Yes, we all can be. (laughs) We can at times. Mark, You know, there are so many podcasts and books about love. So why is it still so fucking hard? Man, you know, it's a it's there's a famous quote from Eric Fromm from the book, The Art of Loving, where he says, which is such a fantastic book. And he says, there's no thing that humans fail at more than love. And yet don't take the time to learn. Mm. Essentially, he makes the argument that love is an art, like it's a skill set. And I really believe that, you know, if you were. He gives the example that if you were to become, let's say, a surgeon, you would take the time to learn the physiology of the body and the pathology of the things and whatever. And he's like, but we don't do that. And, you know, when I was in my late 20s, I went through a breakup. And at the time, I uh, ironically, I was working in pharma. I was in pharmaceutical sales and I was really good at it. Mm -hmm. And I wondered to myself, why am I so good at all these other relationships, but not romantic ones? Why am I so good at communicating, but not in romance? Like this isn't skill set as a problem. There's, There's actually something more going on here. And I was obsessed with wanting to understand what made successful relationships, because I knew that for myself, it's what I wanted the most was was to experience love that was connective, trustworthy. I'd experienced betrayals. I'd betrayed myself. I'd betrayed other people. And I wondered, man, like, why do some people stay together forever and love each other and other people stay together forever and hate each other? And why, when I left an engagement and I feel more connected to myself than I ever have, Mm -hmm. do I also feel more judged by the people around me Mm -hmm. for my relationship ending or quote unquote failing? And so I think it's hard because there's so many of the things that we do in love are actually to avoid being hurt. And yeah. because we're trying to avoid being hurt, you know, I think it's a strange, maybe it's a joke, a cosmic joke, but it's like where the thing you want most lives, mm-hmm. love is where the thing you're most afraid of also dwells. Yeah. And so it's the path really of walking connection and relationship is to actually explore the things you're afraid of, because then you build the skill set yeah. to walk towards the thing you most desperately desire. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me think, I mean, speaking of walking, because it's like an intrinsic process to our biological evolution or our personal development, like, you know, we crawl, we walk, et cetera. And it, and it does take a lot of work, but often we suck so much less at walking and running than we do at the same, like we also intrinsically have love as part of our developmental process. Mm -hmm but we suck so much more at love than we do at walking and running. Yeah. It's so interesting because I think like something that's a physiological experience, right. Of building the neuro 
pathways to be able to fire the legs and all the things and become yeah. a bipedaler. It's not really dependent on the attunement of another person, mm. right? It's a survival based thing. And I, th I think developmentally humans by the, when a horse is born or a dog is born, they're equivalent developmentally to a child being 18 months, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, what really develops us relationally is really those really early moments, especially the first, I mean, first many years, but especially the first years, especially with mom. Yeah. And, you know, we don't know how to self-regulate. We can't self-regulate till we're about three. So all of our ability to actually get into regulation and, and have a, a nervous system that operates on its own yeah. uh, requires an attuned parent. And I would argue that our society, that's not necessarily the failure of the parent, mm -hmm. although it can be. It is often because society and, and communities are not structured to support the parents, especially now. I mean, how many to pay for shit, you know, you got to have generally two working parents yeah. and society wants all moms to be now working and we shame moms for wanting to stay at home. And then we shame, uh, we shame women who work saying they should, you know, it's like, <laughs> how do you fucking win? You don't, you don't, you win by doing whatever the fuck you actually desire and try mm -hmm. to create that space to be able to attune to your kid. You know, it's, but it's never too late. You know, it's never too late. And it's never too, if we didn't get that as kids, which I argue most of us didn't, um, we can create that with someone else. And that's a beautiful thing. I want to start with the question of what is healing? Because it's all the rage. Everyone wants to do it these days. They're into it. It's, it's hot to trot. So what is healing? I mean, I'm just going to speak to it from myself for a moment, like yeah. not from the hat of, of like the clinical hat that I wear with others, but just my own reference point for a moment of what has healing been for me, yeah. which has been a, a wild ride sometimes, <laughs> like a fucking Bronco sometimes, other times like a gentle unfolding and a gathering of practices that have helped me be really compassionate toward myself and towards the places in me that know suffering and the ability to be in relationship to those places in, in me so that I can understand who I am and how I've been shaped by my unique life circumstances so that I can understand how I respond to the world around me. And I love the way that Dan Siegel speaks about this process as, as cultivating coherence, right? Like mm -hmm. I have this narrative understanding and this embodied relationship to that understanding of who I am. And therefore I can take more responsibility of how I show up for others and the impact that I have with others in the world. So this, you know, very circuitous, non-linear journey, right? It stands against certain ways that I've gotten trained in terms of what healing is supposed to look like. And yeah. there's these six sessions or there's a protocol or there's like, check these boxes in the healing department. And it's never looked that way for me. It's been like, oh, I needed to loop back to this place and really wrap myself around it again. Or I needed to attend to this place in my body that has shown up again and and reared her head again to be known. And then it takes me um, through felt sense association right to where I need to go for that next layer to unfold. Mm, I love that you're taking us on like this visceral journey of your healing process and and hopefully those are, who are listening or watching can get some normalization to it in the sense of like some mm. categorical definition of like, this is what healing looks like. This is how you know you've arrived there. This is what happens when you're done doing it. Because the idea of healing is such like a generalized word at this point. I, I, I think I've even felt like I've forgotten what it means. And so to hear you talk about what it's meant for you really feels resonant in me. I'm like going, oh yeah, I, I recognize like it's this journey. It's mm -hmm. this journey. You know, there's also the, these concepts of the journey towards something like wholeness. 
And that's a common word that often comes up with healing. And how does that word sit with you now at this point in your life and your career? Is it a journey towards wholeness? To some degree, but wholeness is a concept and yeah. the felt experience is something else. Like mm. what I love about being a yoga teacher and why I've been drawn, for example, to show up on my yoga mat literally every day yeah. or to sit in my own meditation practice literally every day is that there is this, this feeling of what I would call more like a homecoming mm. where I get to arrive back to myself, good, bad, ugly, right? The whole, the whole range of it. Yeah. And I get to arrive back and that, you know, for me, the yoga mat represents this, this completely unconditional accepting environment that no matter what I bring to that space is welcome there. And that's what home means to me is that I'm not going to leave out any part of my experience for the sake of somebody else can't handle it or I, I can't show that in order to be accepted in this space or whatever that is. And it's also why I love my home practice is that like there's nobody else there. So like I don't have to worry about if I make a really intense face like or I have growl on my mat. I did a lot of that today. <laughs> <laughs> or I cry or I feel joyful and expansive because there's nobody else to compare myself to. It's just about and I've had to work really hard to be able to provide that space for myself. So when you ask, like, what is healing or what is even wholeness feel like it is to for me, the ability to provide for myself that unconditional acceptance uh, that no matter what arises, I'm going to show up for myself with that. And that took time. And it, and so on uh, route to getting there, there were so many places in which I needed somebody else to help hold what I couldn't hold yet in myself and to see what I couldn't see yet in myself. And not that I'm like done. I actually don't know that healing is like, okay, wow, you're done. You've like reached the wholeness gate, right? I really appreciate and love like this idea of like wholeness is like being able to hold the whole of you oh. and like everything is welcome and everything is being in becoming more in relation because it sounds like the, the opposite of well-being or, you know, and then the process to get there, which we might call healing is this interruption of that welcoming interruption of being able to have the capacity to hold all of us or having so much of us that is in a strategy of protecting, but maybe not representative of the core sense of who we are. Yeah. And all of those experiences are learned, right? Yeah. Like, like who couldn't accept you? Who, mm. you know, for whom did you have to perform in order to be loved? Or for whom did you have to exile off parts of yourself in order to belong? It's so sad to hear it said like that. Mm -hmm. I, are we talking about when we, we have to exile parts of ourselves or overperform? Is this, is this, in your opinion, like what the heart of trauma is? Yeah. Is this, how would you define it? Well, I mean, we can think of trauma in a whole continuum where mm -hmm. um, some of it lives in that relational arena. And to some degree, all of us have some variation of this because, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm both speaking as a child and a parent, right? I've fulfilled yeah. both roles in this life and, and there isn't perfection um, out there. And so experiences in which someone else didn't meet our needs and, and couldn't, couldn't um, see all of us is a rather universal experience. And we might call that developmental trauma. We have that arena of trauma. And then we have the arenas that might be those incidents, right? Like we can kind of like pin, there's a traumatic event, whether it's an accident or a natural disaster or a terrorist event, right? Like there's these events. Um, I think what makes developmental trauma harder is that be when you're growing up in that environment, it's the water you're swimming in, right? And so it is just the air you're breathing. It is what you, who you know yourself to be. And so unless you have the ability to separate from it or even have the luxury of questioning that environment, 
you just have to exist and you have to find a way to make it normal. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I can imagine so many of us who are listening to Ariel right now go, Ooh, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. And I've had these experiences. Does that mean I'm traumatized? And, and, and this is a, like an interesting thing. And, and you and I have talked a lot about it is like the, the usage and the globalization and the generalization and the permission and the gift of the word trauma. That's why I felt like it was really important to write F the fairy tale now before it changes again, yeah. because yeah. I was feeling this sense of uh, frustration, burnout, disappointment that was growing and growing. And I was like, I got to capture this moment of mm. really when you think of it, human connection, I am on gently used human right here. Uh, <laughs> human connection is really one of the most important things of our life, in our life, yeah. who we choose to spend our time with and how we spend it yeah. impacts everything else, your mental health. Mm -hmm. Your where maybe where you live, your finances, your family, it, it impacts everything. And yet it's the decision that is often left to chance or we just yeah. kind of go with the flow. Yeah. So I like asking what happens if we do what you were just saying of like expanding the love <laughs> and clarifying really what we want, like what we need, what's going to make our hearts feel whole. And date from that place rather than this fantasy fairy tale idea of how it's supposed to look and then reverse engineering everything to try to fit into that ideal. A lot of people have asked me about the title thinking that when I say F the fairy tale, I'm meaning fuck love, like no for fuck relationships. It's a hundred percent the opposite. Wait, 180 yeah. degrees. I get these numbers. confused. <laughs> it's 180 degrees. The opposite. What I'm saying yeah. is the the subtitle really rewrite yeah. the dating myths and live yeah. your own love story. It is meant to yeah. be an empowering book that helps you understand like what is really happening. Why are we so attached to this fairy tale idea? I, idea, mm -hmm. and it looks different from for everyone, of course. The reality is there that we are imprinted by whatever our gender, whatever our orientation, we have had those ideals imprinted upon us yeah. by media, by our families, by our social circles. Yeah. And yeah. it's really hard to parse out what we actually need and separate that from what we have been told. Mm. But that's where all the juicy stuff is. It's so hard. I mean, it's also like, I mean, we, we all grew up with it. It was sort of like what we idealized and, and it's so hard to break free and, and separate ourselves from like, because it, it gets absorbed and, and it starts operating on like the sub unconscious level that we don't even realize, oh, I'm seeking that same sort of magic spark, which often is just a trauma tingle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you. You know that. And <laughs> I know that. <laughs> you know Hell when no, people I are know. addicted yeah. to drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, in your work, you, you see yeah. how this shows up. You see the negative effects of people yeah. being unable to see that. Yeah. Because then we do, uh, we do tend to drum up drama. We get, yeah. we feel like, oh, if I feel the spark, then this is right. When we don't yeah. realize that's actually the sign that this person is triggering. Yeah. old wounds and patterns yeah. and things that we want to leave in the past and that we really yeah. have the power. Like what yeah. I really want people to know when they read this book is that we have all the, the power in us to be able to change our path in love. If you're yeah. not where you are right now, if you're not where you want to be in love, if you're not in the relationship that you dream of, what happens if you see yourself in the driver's seat, you know, main character mm -hmm. energy up on her. <laughs> you, if you have that main character energy, really it, it's, it's your fairy tale to be told yeah. you give yourself back the pen. You can write it differently. Yeah. So what are some of the major myths just so we can like move them into the conscious awareness and start to like let them dissolve? 
so they're not controlling us. What are the four biggest myths that I see clients coming to me for help with? And I have always looked at dating as a set of learned skills. And it's sort of this continuum yeah. where in my program, I always start people with mindset. And we yeah. walk through sort of chronologically through the dating process. And mm. there is a process. And then it's yeah. wash, rinse, and repeat. And each of those phases can take, it can take a weeks. It could take months. Yeah. It could take years. And sometimes you got to start back over at the beginning. But... What I did was identify each, a myth for each phase of the process that I walk people okay. through. So the first myth around that, that mindset, I was like, what do, what do people come to me for help with? Well, Demona, I've got this list, you see. <laughs> I have this list of qualities that I'm looking for. And mm -hmm. I was told by the fairy tales and my mom and my sister and, you know, all, all the people in my life that they were supposed to look like this. They were supposed to make this much money. They were supposed to have this education. They were supposed to live in this neighborhood. And that list, that list myth, I see keeping a lot of people stuck. And so I'm not saying throw out the list. I'm saying flip the list on, on its ear and ask yourself why you want those things on that list. And if those are actually the things that you mm. should be pursuing. How do we know? Like, Shit, like uh, now I'm even thinking about the list I used to make and I'm like, no, those are my values. So how do we how do we identify it? So lucky for you, I have gotten <laughs> underneath that with the antidote to each of the myths mm. and the things I, I talked in my practice for a long time about the four pillars of long term compatibility and okay. the elements that I consistently saw come up in relationships for my clients that did last, that that did make them happy, that did meet their needs. Mm. And it was really interesting to me when I stepped back and looked at the myths, they aligned really well with all of these pillars. So the antidote mm. to dating by list is yeah. first figuring out date by goals. What is this person? What are, what are their relationship goals? And mm. I put goals first. Values are in there, Scott, and we'll get to that okay. in a second. But I put goals in there first because I saw so many people that get so far down the road and then realize that they were always on a different path from the person that they were dating. And then they feel cheated and frustrated and exhausted that they have to sort of start over when if you're not aligned in your goals from the first from the first few dates, generally the goals don't suddenly shift is like in an, in an organic and authentic way. Like that yeah. person could be like, Oh yeah, well, that's what I want too. Yes. I, oh sure. Yeah. I'm open to kids. And if, if they <laughs> originally did not have their goal, that goal in mind, it's, it's sort of a, a false pretense that you're beginning the relationship on. And there are people that like don't know, like maybe you don't know if you want kids or you want marriage or where you want to live or whatever. That's okay. But talk about those things early on so that you yeah. can see if you are in the same ballpark. I'll uh, share a little story from my own life too. When I was dating my husband, I think we had been dating maybe two years and he he was living like the, the dude bachelor lifestyle, like, yeah, you yeah. know, three bedroom apartment, like one bathroom, like piled up with a bunch of other bros. And, uh, uh <laughs> one of his roommates was moving out. And so he said, well, I kind of need to figure out, do I want to get another roommate and keep this lease or like maybe move in with you? Maybe we can end the lease. I could just move in with you. And Scott, I have to tell you, I had just gotten this perfect, I was renting this condo. It was perfect. It had this like open floor plan. I had a walk-in closet, yes. beautiful corner unit, balcony, whatever. So thrilled to finally, it was the first time I had ever lived by myself. I'd always yeah. had roommates and I was like, I'm adulting. <laughs> and he was like, uh, yeah, maybe I can come and live with you. And I was like, er, hold on a second. Like very invested in the relationship. But yeah. That is not, I'm not moving in out of convenience or because this arbitrary lease is up and you need to make a decision. 
I only want you to move in here if this is a step towards marriage. And I actually said that because that was my relationship goal. Okay. And a lot of people are afraid to voice that because what if you say, oh, this is a step towards marriage. And they're like, no. And then your heart's broken. Yeah. But I was brave enough in that moment to say, I'm not going to compromise my relationship goal just for convenience or because like it would be nice to have someone split the rent on this place. <laughs> and you know what happened, Scott? What? I asked him that question and he was like, hmm, I need to think about it. Yeah. I did not. I, I talk about a, couple, about a couple of examples of this in, in the book where yeah. I bravely asked a question and did not get the answer I wanted but you have to be willing to hear the answer you get. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to take some time to think about this and I'll get back to you. So I was like, literally take all the time that you need because you ain't coming in here in this apartment and taking up my, excuse me, my walk-in closet. <laughs> if you are not with coming in with Putting the right intentions. Ring on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, it took him about two months. It took him about two months. And then he came back to me and said, I, I do want this to be a step towards marriage. And then I think we got engaged within a year from there. So, you know, it was just making sure that our relationship goals were aligned, but that, that brave piece of sharing, being vulnerable. I know you talk about this all the time here, like that vulnerability, it's really hard to access. Oh, it's so hard. I mean, especially, especially when we've been bruised before. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot about it in terms of like, I miss the naivete before the first heartbreak where it's like, oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be brave. I can, I'm, I can do anything, say anything. And then when we have that first like wound and we know what's on the other side of that bravery, if we don't get met, it's, it's just so hard to build up back to that. Or even if we're trying to compare ourselves back to that moment before naivete, we can never really get there. We never can get there. But a possible reframe on that is yes. if you are vulnerable and you yeah. share what's really on your heart, you can get your needs met better because yes. that you can see yeah. where the other person can meet your need or not meet your need. And you're yeah. operating based on transparency. Yeah. And I'm willing to get my heart broken. Like I would, I would be much happier expressing my truth Mm -hmm. and seeing that something is not a match Yeah. rather than, you know, sort of playing house or pretending and making the assumption that the other person is in the same space. And then isn't that so much more heartbreaking? Yeah. To then yeah. realize down the road, I thought I was in one relationship and this person clearly was in another. So true. Thank you for joining us on this journey through some of the most memorable moments from our recent episodes. I hope these highlights have sparked new insights and inspired you as much as they've inspired me. If you found value in these conversations, I'd love for you to share them with your fellow gently used humans. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you have a moment, please leave a review. It helps us reach more people who could benefit from these powerful discussions. Until next time, keep growing, keep healing, and keep being the wonderfully imperfect humans that you are.